This is Art Divine Ministries, and for the last two years, we have been studying the book of John, the book of Revelation, and the book of Acts. And today, we're going to conclude uh, the book of Acts with a study of Romans, a brief overview of the epistle of Romans. Because Paul the Apostle, he did so much to prepare the early church for the way in which they were to live. How then shall we live? Really, this is what Paul is asking when he comes to us in, in and through the scriptures. How then shall we live? And particularly the book of Romans. And this is why we've selected this as an overview of the writings of Paul the Apostle. We have completed a long study of the book of Acts. And we've seen how Paul endured so many trials and troubles and near-death experiences to go from city to city to city to city and present the word and make sure that the fledgling church, the ecclesia, would actually survive. And it has survived even 2,000 years to this very day. Now today, as we think about the teachings of Paul, I'm reminded of how way in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, how we learned that God is the master potter and that he is working us over, each and every one of us, because we are, even as um, earthen vessels, we are just simply earthen vessels. And we're being turned on the wheel of life, so to speak. And God, who is the master potter, he comes and he turns us again and again and again. And just when we think we're all okay, he comes and he presses us down and smashes us again against the wheel and we turn some more until he finally turns us into an earthen vessel that he can be uh, proud of and happy with. And then we think we're, we're finished and we're okay, but no. He puts us up on a shelf, and there we sit on this little shelf, along with all the multitude of other little earthen vessels, clay pots, as it were. And then the master pottery comes in one day, and he sees us on the shelf, and he takes us off, and we're so excited. But no, he puts us in a really hot kiln, the furnace, and we suddenly find ourselves under the teachings again and again and again of the Holy Spirit. And the refiner comes and refines us. And now we're taken out of the heat and out of the fire and placed back up on the shelf. But now we're shiny and transparent, even glowing in the reflection of the goodness of God. And now we're fit for the master's use. This indeed is the journey of the little earthen pot, each of which we are little earthen pots someday to become shiny and acceptable, useful in the master's care. Because our destiny, the end of our journey, all of us will come into the glory of God. And how can that happen unless we're purified, unless we're made holy, unless we're righteous, Unless the walk we have on this earth brings us to a place of overcoming victory. My friends, this is what we've learned from this study of the book of Acts, the book of, of all the Ephesians, Romans, Philippi, Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, even into Timothy and Titus and all the other writings of Paul the Apostle. He wrote most of the New Testament. And yes, he was someone that came into the kingdom of God, not as one of the original disciples, but as someone that came and met the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. And each of us have met the Lord on our personal road to Damascus. And the Lord has come to us, and he came to Paul that day, and he said, Saul, Saul, because 
Paul was actually born in Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus. And Jesus said, why do you kick against? Why do you kick against this truth? And he was made blind for a season and then commissioned to serve the Lord with all his heart and all his soul. And he loved the Lord even as we love the Lord. My friends, we've all had this opportunity to meet the Lord on our road to Damascus. And here today, we are going to conclude our studies, and we're going to summarize some of the readings from the book of Romans, because it, has, it encapsulates most of the teachings. And we're going to begin by saying, first of all, the Lord's divine concept of salvation for all believers is the basic and very fundamental work of Paul, the apostle in the book of Romans. This is very fundamental to our belief in salvation. It is quite apparent to say the, these words, that the initial intent that God had for us is holiness and righteousness. It's all been eclipsed by immoral behavior and false doctrines. And we are living in a time right now, my friends, where evil is called good and good is called evil. And to cry out for a voice of justice and truth is to possibly expose ourselves to ridicule and even exile. And this is in the day that we live right now. Not a whole lot different from the day in which Paul the Apostle lived or even the day um, just uh, previous to that when Jesus lived and for his 33 and a half years and where he was crucified and condemned by the Roman Empire. And you see, it's the same. Evil is the same evil. And today we're fighting this, but we can fight it with the knowledge that God has overcome this. These are the last days spoken of by the prophets, because we know that the end of the story, don't we? We know that we can face tomorrow. Christ has already won this victory. Justification by faith is the word that the Apostle Paul wrote, wrote. This is the declaration of the gospel which he received by the revelation given to him by Jesus Christ. So today we're going to study and we're going to begin. Uh, last week we did chapter one and today we will begin with chapter two and we're going to read selected verses in order that we can finish several of these chap of these chapters today in one in one season in one city all right chapter 2 verse 1 therefore thou art inexcusable o man whosoever thou art that judge judges for wherein thou judgest another thou condemnest thyself for thou that judgest does the very same thing but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek after glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. Verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. Verse 11, for there is no respect of persons with God. And verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. And verse 19, and art confident that thou art self a guide to the blind and a light to those that are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of godliness and of the truth in the law. Verse 21, thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou yourself? You that practice a man should not steal, do you steal? These are the words of Paul 
the apostle in chapter 2, verse 22. That's what it says a man should not commit a crime. Do you commit these sins? You that hate idols, do you have sacrilege, sacrilege in your life as well? These are really hard questions, aren't they? You judge others, but do you have this going on in your life? This is what uh, Paul is writing in this chapter 2. Verse 25, for the rites that you practice don't profit very much, but you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, those initial rites, they're useless, aren't they? If you break the law. Therefore, if those that do this keep the law, of, but you do not keep the law, what, what difference does it make? Verse 28, for you are outwardly a Jew, verse 29, but inwardly you do not keep the law in your heart. And, this, and in the spirit, you keep the letter of the law, but you do not keep it before God. So here we have an indictment against people that say one thing and pretend to be followers of the law, but they really are not. And now we will hear a commentary on chapter 2. Paul knew there were believers in Rome. He wrote to the church in Rome to know what they believed and how they were to live. In chapter 1, the key verse is, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation <clears throat> for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the righteousness of God, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's in verse 16 and 17. Paul is telling the world that they are under God's wrath, and Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. One needs to recognize that there is a need for a savior. Universalism teaches that because Jesus died on the cross, everyone is saved. This is not true. We must receive the gift. The requirement is faith to receive the grace of God. The groups of people are godless, suppressing the truth of his goodness, educated moralists, and the religionist. Chapter two discusses the refined, educated moralist who believes in right and wrong. Paul is saying to these people, do you think, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? That's verses 3 and 4 of Romans chapter 2. Low slowness of bringing judgment is his kindness to give more time to repent. They who have a feeling of superiority, they have a feeling of superiority. John 8 reminds us of the moralist who could not cast the first stone. Paul stresses the idea of good works. If people are really born again, they will show the life of God in their life. This, there's a natural outflow. God will render eternal life to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immorality. That's verse seven of chapter two. Religious people do all their rites and customs and believe that is all they need for salvation. Just knowing the word doesn't mean they won't stand in judgment. It is living the word. They are put to their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. This is the primary thing to do. Religious people put their faith in knowing what the word says. In this chapter, it is mentioned that some people believe they can keep the law perfectly. Nobody will be justified by keeping the law. Religion doesn't change one who is in the heart. They are an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. 
You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? That's in Romans chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Living the Christian life is harder than teaching it. It is asked if the religious person has victory over the lusts of the heart. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Romans 3.20 now in beginning the reading in chapter 3 again selected verses verse 1 what advantage then has the jew or what profit is the rights that they follow verse 2 much every way chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of god and this refers to the Abrahamic covenant, wherein the Jew was the selected uh, nation of, by God. Verse 3, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Verse 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou might be judged by thy sayings, and might overcome when you are judged. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Let's just say that again. There are none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11, there is no one that understands. There is no one that seeks after God. That's a pretty heavy admonition, isn't it? Continuing, verse 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no one be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is very, very important. By the law, there is knowledge of the sin. Verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, let's read that over again. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I think this is really what Paul wants to get across in this lengthy passage. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, who God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God. That's a powerful, powerful verse. Verse 28, therefore we conclude that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. This is what the whole idea is. We are justified by faith without works that the law would require. Verse 29, is he the God of the Jews also or only? Or is he also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, he is the God of both Jew and Gentile. Verse 30, there is but one God who justifies faith through faith. Verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? And again, the Lord says, God forbid. Yea, we establish the law through faith. You know, the, the major verse that I believe should work right here is that Jesus came to fulfill the law, all the law and the prophet. And now we will read the commentary, if you will, on chapter three, please. Chapter three is filled with rhetorical questions that do not require answers. Religion will not save you. This applies to any religious Jew or Christian. The Jews were set apart to receive the law as his chosen. No other nation on earth received this. Does the unfaithfulness nullify the Jews and what they were given? No, it does not. 
David cries out to God against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Psalm 51, 4. It is in this psalm that the sinner comes back to full communion by forgiveness and cleansing. In the dispensational time for the Jewish nation, they will come back to God in full belief in the tribulation. Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 10. Because of hypocrisy, the testimony of the Christian is damaged. Unfaithfulness of God's people doesn't nullify what God has done. This is fundamental teaching of the New Testament. Paul emphasizes that both Jew and Gentile have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one does right. Everyone has turned away. He describes mankind and the evil in their hearts. Again, how very important is Paul's admonition. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 20. Good works will not bring salvation. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 24. To be justified, it is just as though I never sinned. What Jesus did, he did for me. It is finished. The righteousness of God is satisfied. The work of the cross redeemed mankind by paying the price. Propitiation is hilsterian in Greek. Jesus was ter has turned away this sin and God receives the sacrifice. The mercy seat is sprinkled with his precious blood. If there be any other way, Jesus cried out in Gethsemane, he would partake of the cup which contained all the sin of the world. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. The holiness of God was satisfied by his only begotten Son. We can now enter boldly into the throne of grace, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Verse 25. The Old Testament sacrifices under the Old Covenant were pointing forth to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. No animal sacrifice could take our sins away. Only God himself could. God found a way to punish sin and to save the sinner. Christ for the collective sin of all. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. We are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Verse 28. By faith we keep the law. A beginning in chapter 4. Selected and very powerful verses. I believe what we're doing here is helping the, the one who comes in to see our work. will understand that Paul, his greatest intention was to show that salvation is by Jesus Christ alone. He is the only way to the Father. My friends, let's begin with chapter 4, selected verses. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Verse 4. Now to him that works, worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Faith counted for righteousness. All we have to do, truly, is to believe. We cannot work our way to heaven. Jesus did all of that on the cross for each and every one of us. We come to God through faith alone and not by works. Verse 7, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And going on, verse 15, because the law works wrath, but where there is no law, 
there is no transgression. Think about that. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. That's interesting, isn't it? Verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seeds. That would be to everyone who would follow. Remember the covenant given to Abraham was that his seed would be as the stars of the sky. That would be the spiritual seed. And as the sands of the shore. And that would be the physical um, flesh that would continue through his generations. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see, my friends, God's covenant is sure. He sealed that covenant by the blood of Jesus Christ. What God has done is yea and amen, is one and, once and for all. Nothing ever will change the covenant that God has made with his people, all people. His great love, you see, brought the Gentiles into this covenant. Though Abraham, as a Jew, brought the faith of Abraham, brought all the Jewish people, but now we see the covenant extends to us, the Gentiles. It is one new man, the Jew and the Gentile. We all have the opportunity to believe, not by the law, but by faith in the finished work of Christ on Calvary. This is the gospel. Jesus, who has raised from the dead and lives eternally, and for the joy that was set before him, he went to the cross. We are his joy that we would come into this covenant of promise. And now look at chapter 5. Selected verses from Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. And not only so, that we glory in the tribulation, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Verse 12. Therefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moving on to chapter 6. Yes. Romans chapter 6, a selected verses. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That was verses 1 and 2. Verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to, of sin. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's verse 22 and 23. In chapter 7, one of the most um, powerful passages of scripture, scripture is seen as Paul says these words because he's referring to himself as just an ordinary man. And he says very clearly in verse 18, 
for I know that in me, that is, in my humanity, dwells no good thing. For to will to pre is present with me. I really want to do these things. And however, um, but in thee dwells no good thing, but how to, to do this, I find it impossible to do. I mean, there's so many ways of expressing his frustration. He said, my mind wants to do the right thing, but in my humanity, I can't do it. So this is a battle, a tremendous battle between the spirit and the natural man. And this is a battle which goes on in all of us, even to this day. Could you say, sure. <laughs> for the good that I would, I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. This is a powerful phrase. Now, if I do that which I would not, it is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. <laughs> well, we know that when we come to the cross of Calvary, the back of sin is broken. It no longer has effect on us. And we know that we have eternal life because Jesus is the only one that can bear the sin of the whole world. That's what was in the cup that he partook of. But we come into that covenant through faith in believing the final efficacious work of the blood of Christ upon the cross, that it was received by God. The propitiation of our sin was received by God. He accepted that sacrifice. But here we are, we come to this place just like Paul does. We want, we want to do the right thing, but we don't. So the, the, what that dwells within us is the fact that we still in our humanity, we can sin, but we know the back of sin is broken. And eventually when we find leave the human, human condition, we will come into eternal life where sin no longer exists. But while we're still in this flesh, we do have the battle. If we sin, and this is what the Bible says, we have an advocate with the Father, his name is Jesus Christ, and we can come boldly into the throne room of grace, and we can ask God to forgive us for what we have done. This we can do every day of our life. For while we're still alive, we have even this testimony, just like, just like Paul. And he says, verse 24, O oh, wretched person that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? <laughs> what a cry of the heart. I think of all the things that Paul said in all of the epistles that he wrote. This is the more, most poignant. O oh, wretched person that I am. And then in verse 25, could we say with him, Oh, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself, I serve the law of God, but with humanity, I, I continue to serve the law of sin. So, wow, we want to break that right now in Jesus' name. We break this off, this idea that we still have any connection with sin, because Jesus absolutely fulfilled all of the covenant of promise. He died for every sin, every person, Jew or Gentile, that would ever live on the face of this earth. Now, verse and chapter 8. Selected verses. Um, verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Verses 14 and 15, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verses 24 and 25. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Verse 28. 
And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in the, all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. These are such beautiful and wonderful, wonderful words. Who can resist this wonderful admonition from the Lord? And this is verse 19 in chapter 9. And we will come to a conclusion of our time today by saying in verse 21, a review, really, of the words we began with. Has not the potter power over the clay of the same vessel of making it into honor and one into dishonor? And verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of the glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. And we know <laughs> there is something called um, propitiation of sin, absolute acceptance of the work of Calvary. And we are justified by the faith of God. My friends, today we know that um, we are in right standing because we come through belief to the Lord. Now, in concluding our day, we're going to read just a few beautiful scriptures out of chapter 12. These are the things that the Lord Jesus would like us to do in this world, written through the pen of Paul the Apostle. And verse 9, chapter 12. Let love be without a hesitation. Hate that which is evil. Come close to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. In honor, prefer one another. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Continue instantly in prayer. Distribute to the necessity of others, given to hospitality. Bless those that persecute you. Rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Do not prefer one person over another. And provide things which are honest in the sight of man. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place to the Lord. For the Lord said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Let every person be subject to the Lord, for he has ordained all things. He that loveth one another, loveth and fulfills the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. And again, and this is verse 10, chapter 13, love is the fulfillment of the law. And let us put on the armor of light, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will not fulfill the things of the natural man. This concludes our work today and the study that we have made in the book of Romans. <laughs>